Yom Kippur. Now, I don't, probably don't have to remind you of this, but some of you might not be familiar with it. You probably have heard people talk about it as Yom Kippur, right? Anybody ever heard that? I've heard that from people who don't. So just as a reminder, uh, it's a long O for all the Yom. When you say Yom, in Hebrew it means day. And uh, when you talk about any of the holidays, uh, Yom Teruah, whatever Yom you're talking about, Hi Yom today, um, it's always Yom. So you can impress all your friends with your Hebrew skills that you've learned that Yom Kippur, you can uh, say it that way. And we're going to look this morning uh, at the, a little bit at the past and also at the future of Yom Kippur. There's a lot, uh, a lot to consider here as we, uh, we look at both sides of Yom Kippur. Uh, first of all, the past. The past, what has been done and what has uh, traditionally been part of the observance of this holy day uh, goes way back to the scriptures in Leviticus chapter 23 again. We started out, out and that was, of course, uh, the text that we used at the beginning as to why we're celebrating it or observing it. And Leviticus 23, of course, for those who are perhaps not that familiar with it, is what? The place where you can find all the holy days. So if you learn nothing else, take, if you take no other note in your bulletin by hand than this, Leviticus 23. Remember, that's the place to go to look up all the holy days. And how many holy days are there? Well, okay, I heard a lot. No, well, I did hear seven, and that's true. There are seven Moadim, but there's also the Shabbat. So they kind of, there are seven holy days uh, numbered from zero to seven. For those of you who are computer programmers, you know what I'm talking about. Okay, uh, Leviticus 23 is the place to go for all of those, all eight, if, if you will, including Shabbat. And also Leviticus 16, which is, is like a preview. It comes earlier, as you notice, than Leviticus 23. Well, how is that? If all of the holy days are defined, or at least be initially defined in Leviticus 20, how is it that this holy day starts way back in Leviticus 16? And it does. If you go back and look at the text of Leviticus 16, we'll take a brief look at some of those things. It's amazing. It really is. Then there's a chapter, a small portion of uh, chapter 29 in Numbers. But we're going to focus today on the Leviticus uh, uh, references, and we'll take a look at that. Numbers adds something about uh, um, offerings and, and, and focuses on that. And since we don't have a temple to do offerings, we probably uh, won't be able to follow through on those anyway. But anyway, uh, we'll start by looking a little more carefully at the Leviticus 23 text, which begins at verse 26. And the Lord said to Moses, you know, he talks to Moses a lot. I, you know, I, I, I wish he would talk to me even one-tenth or one-thousandth of what he talked to Moses. Because, you know, I shared on Rosh Hashanah all the times just in Leviticus, that Moses said or spoke to, I mean, uh, yeah, that God spoke to Moses. Moses actually does talk to God too, but uh, we don't have records of those. Those conversations were done in the tabernacle, and uh, we don't have a lot of those. They, you, hear, you hear Moses arguing with God now and then. Have you ever argued with God? It's okay. You probably don't win the arguments, but it's worth trying. <laughs> That's all right. God wants to hear from his children. That means he wants to hear from each one of you the things that are on your heart and mind. On exactly, the text says on verse 27, on exactly the 10th day of the seventh month, very specific, is the day of atonement. God doesn't leave it to, to say, well, somewhere in the fall... You know, to set aside a day to do this. No, no, no. He says specifically this. And we talked uh, uh, last week about uh, Rosh Hashanah, about uh, the week before last, before last Shabbat, a week ago, how uh, God is specific about the seventh month. The seventh month, which is seven being the, the, the number of completion in the Scripture, seven days in a week, and all the sevens that are in the Scripture. We won't take time to go through that. But in the seventh month of the seven holy days, Three of them occur. 
The first, the tenth, and the fifteenth, all in the seventh month. This is the one on the tenth, Yom Kippur. It shall be a holy convocation. So you, should, you are doing the right thing here. You're coming together to join us at this convocation, a holy convocation, uh, Mikdash Kodesh, uh, Mikra Kodesh. It's, it's right here. It shall be a holy convocation for you, and you shall humble your souls and present an offering by fire to the Lord. I was going to bring an altar here to put some, you know, some goats on or something, but um, I decided that uh, Peter would not be happy if I did that, so I didn't uh, pass on that today. You shall not do any work on the same day. So those of you who set up chairs, no, just kidding. The Levites, you know, you got to remember, this is the instruction for the congregation. When they say don't do any work, they're talking about doing things that are not, um, that, that, are, that are part of your l normal labor of earning a living. Taking care of the temple and preparing for uh, services together, that's, that's part of the holy of, part of living, and that's okay. God is not saying don't do that. Otherwise would be a mess here. But you shall not do any labors that you do normally, that you do uh, to earn a living. Don't do any of those on the same day, for it is a day of atonement to make atonement on your behalf before the Lord your God, which is just what you are doing here this morning. If there is any person, by the way, who will not humble himself on the same day, he shall be cut off from his people. Now, remember that this instruction was given <laughs> at a time when they were where? They were in the wilderness, right? Being cut off from your people in the wilderness probably wasn't a good thing. So it meant more then than being cut off from your people today. Today, often if you get cut off from some people, you just move on to the next group, down, down a block. You know, what do they know? You start fresh there, right? Not so in those days. Verse 30, as for any person who does any work on the same day, that person, uh-oh, he won't be able to move down the block even. He says, he, I will destroy from among his people. Hmm. That doesn't sound good. I don't think you want to be destroyed. You shall do no work at all. Let me be clear. Have you got it? No work. It's to be a perpetual statute throughout your generations in all of your dwelling places. God doesn't repeat himself often, but here he does. And when he repeats himself, we should pay attention. It is a Sabbath of complete rest to you, and you shall humble your souls. He keeps saying that. On the ninth of the, uh, of the month at evening, from evening until evening, you shall keep your Shabbat. Now, in summary, we look at what we just read. We know it's the 10th day of the seventh month. Okay, we got that. It's called, it isn't called, you know what? This is a surprise, maybe surprise some of you. It's not called Yom Kippur in this particular text. Well, why are we calling it Yom Kippur? It's actually called Yom HaKippurim. It's a plural. It means uh, typically translated the day of coverings, if you want to be literal about it. What are we covering? The sins that we have committed. Except that's not the way the people would have understood Kippurim in those days. The word Kippurim, while we often think of it as just covering the sins and then Yeshua came and, and erased all them, no, that's not the way they would have taken it when it was told to them. They understood it as atoning, really paying for and purging, cleansing, pardoning, and forgiving. That was the way they would have understood the, the word then. When God calls for holy convocation, they would have put aside everything and been there, whether they have a sore throat or not. Goes on to say, humble yourselves, which is the word um, initem, which is, uh, means to kind of, um, it can be afflict your souls, uh, it could be a word afflict, or it can be subdue your souls, because your souls are out of control. Regain control of them. 
conquer them. Answer, the word can also, and that means can, can answer, mean like, like answer it back at them. In your case, your soul is trying to pull you one way and maybe you're not listening. Maybe your soul needs a little adjustment. You ever seen a place that says, adjust, soul adjustments right here? <laughs> it's called, and above it it says, Yom Kippur, right? Well, if I look at that list for uh, initem, what you're supposed to do, that's translated humble your souls, I don't see the word fast in there. Do you? <laughs> Cancel that fast. I mean, look, it says initem, initem doesn't mean fast. So why are we fasting? Whose idea was that? Humble your souls. Subdue them. Why are we fasting? Anybody know why we're fasting? We have, we have, okay. You know, this is the way the text has been interpreted by the rabbinic community for as long as we know. If you go back, and I'm going to go back now here and share something with you that was written as part of our scripture a thousand years after Moses commanded through God, God's command about uh, humbling your souls. And this is from the book of Ezra, chapter 8. Verse, it's about a thousand years after um, uh, the uh, Exodus, okay? And they were in the wilderness. Verse 21 of, uh, of chapter 8, Ezra wrote, Then I, Ezra, proclaimed a what? A fast there at the river of Ahava, that we might do what? Humble ourselves before our God to seek from him a safe journey for us, our little ones and all our possessions. He connected. Ezra may have been the first one to interpret the way you, you humble your souls by fasting. We have it right here in the text. Now, this this particular, it's a fascinating little text here because you go back and look at this in the book of Ezra if you have time today and you should have time during your fasting um, if you're doing that. And look at Ezra and recognize that he is saying this. Think about the time frame when Ezra spoke, when Ezra lived. About 450 BCE. That's about 100 years, 90 years or so after Cyrus, remember? Cyrus came and, can and conquered Babylon and sent, gave the Jewish people who were living in Persia, this huge country, permission to go back home. Go west. Build your temple. And while you're there, build, build a wall against the Greeks so they don't come and bother me. A hundred years after Cyrus did that, <clears throat> Jewish people are still in Babylon and they're getting ready for another, they're just, here it says it, that, uh, that they gathered there at the river of Ahava, which is uh, along somewhere just north, a little bit of uh, Babylon, along the Euphrates River. And there is where he established, or at least we know that he mentioned this uh, fasting as a way of humbling. It's fascinating history on all of these things. And he goes on to say, if you won't do that, and you all are doing it, if you won't do that, you'll be cut off from his people. Okay, we, uh, we're scared about that, and so we're going to make sure to do what he says. Supposed to present a, uh, an offering by fire. At any time you see an offering by fire in Scripture, it is always for sin. There are a lot of type, different types of offerings, but when you see an offering by fire, remember, that's a sin offering, consuming. Shabbat Shabbaton and we're called to have a, is a, a holiday of complete rest. It can be, it doesn't mean on Shabbat necessarily, it's a, it can be in the middle of the week. A complete rest. And if not, goodbye. Now, um, that's a quick summary of what is in the chapter 23 of Leviticus regarding a Yom Kippur instructions. But if we go back to Leviticus 16, there are a few instructions in there for the high priest. Just a few. 
and actually this is a bit of a summary, there's even more than this. There won't be a test on this today, okay? I just don't want, you don't have to worry about it. But in Leviticus 16, we have all of these things. And as I read through them again in preparation for this time in his word, I uh, came, I just, it jumped out at me, number, and I've highlighted in uh, bright yellow, number six and number eight. Number six and number eight are sprinkling the blood of the, uh, first number six, sprinkle the blood of the bull on the mercy seat. We won't have time to go through all of them. Sprinkle the blood of the bull on the mercy seat, which is one of the things he's gonna, the high priest was supposed to do. And why was he supposed to do that? I don't know if you can read it. If you didn't, if you didn't buy the front row tickets, you might not be able to see from their back. But anyway, uh, because of his unintentional sins, these are the sins of the high priest. My goodness. Sacrifice for his unintentional sins. Then on number eight is another sacrifice. A ram for his intentional sins. Better not use that high priest as your model because if you look to him, he's not the ideal model for you, is he? And throughout history, the high priest always had to do sacrifices for himself until our high priest came, the one we call Yeshua. No sins were necessary, no high sacrifices were necessary. I want to share with you just seven quick observations on Leviticus, on this, this sec, that section of Leviticus 16. It's pretty clear when you read through it that God says, this is one way, this is the only way to approach him. Uh, you can only approach him as he specifies. A lot of people, I hear this all the time. There are many roads to God, right? Have you heard that? Many paths. No, that's not true. That's wishful thinking. That's putting words in God's mouth. God didn't say that. You, somebody else said that, and you thought it was a nice idea. It's not true. Today we know the only way to approach him is through the blood of the lamb. But in truth, we know that atonement, because you need to be cleansed. You see, it's like, think of yourself as like a, a little boy that's been playing in the backyard, in the muddy backyard. And you've been out, and, and, and your mother calls you for dinner. Okay, now what are you going to do? Come on in, dinner's ready. What do you do? Later, Mom, I'm busy right now. No. You're going to run inside dinner. You're, you're anxious to get in here. So you run right in, and, and she, you start running in right up to the, to the table. And your mom says, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Wash your hands. Now on second thought, go take a shower. You're full of mud. Then come and sit down. You see, you're not ready to sit down. Even though you may think so, and you've been called, you need to be washed and cleaned. And atonement is the way to do that for sins. Leviticus 17, 11, the famous text. For the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you on the altar to make atonement for your souls. I know this text is familiar to many of you, but he goes on to say, for it is the blood by reason of the life that makes atonement. Interesting thought that what's running through your body right now is your blood. And when your heart stops pumping that blood, your body gives up. The blood truly is a lifeblood. And without that, if it doesn't have the right stuff in it, it's game over. God has given it to us to make us aware of the, of the great concern, <laughs> great problem we have about our sins, the great cost of cleansing us from sin. Leviticus 16 also makes it very clear that a mediator is needed under the laws of Moses. Sacrifices were required for a sinful human uh, mediator for himself and also uh, for the nation. 
the nation then if you read through 16 you'll see the two goats were required for the nation one had the blood shed it was neck was cut and he was sacrificed the other one they put their hands on him prayed for uh, for the sins of the nation to be taken then they took him out uh, out of the camp and released him in the wilderness atonement was required not just for the things you did wrong that you intentionally did but for also things that you may have done accidentally and the sequence was always this the blood was shed for the atonement first then the confession of the sins and then that finally removed the sin. So that was the order. God is so specific about all this. I don't know why anyone who knows anything about the scripture would, would even tolerate some of the ideas that people are expressing in this world today about God. Those who even believe that there's a God. You know? You know anybody who doesn't believe in God? Anybody here know anybody who doesn't believe in God? I had a lot of friends. I won't talk about that. They don't believe in God. Some are just agnostic. That's a nice way to be. Others are downright opposed, atheist. We have people in this country who are writing laws to prevent you from talking about God in the public square. Now, I could get very political here, but I won't. But those are people are not in, those people are not recognizing what God has uh, already said. If he isn't in the public square, we have no, we have nothing. That's the historic, a quick look at the historic way of observing Yom Kippur. What is the significance of that? But as was mentioned um, earlier, this holy day, as for each of the seven days, has both an historic understanding and uh, uh, obser uh, observing the traditions associated with what was done historically, but then there are prophecy. It's prophetic. It teaches something about the future. And when you look at all seven of them, and we won't take the time this morning because we're actually out of time almost right now, but I have a few more things, a few hundred more things to say. Um, each one of the holy days, each one of the holy days in the scripture points to some event in the life of Yeshua. When I was growing up and went to Hebrew school, we learned about the historic, a little bit about the historic ways of observing these holy days, and we didn't have anything about the prophetic view of what these holy days were teaching. I doubt that my Hebrew school teacher even heard of those because people have a tendency to repeat and teach what they have learned. It's an encourage, you know, learn, a lot of you have gone to college or other, and maybe beyond just undergraduate school, you learn many things. When I started at my job, which I am now, my first job, which I have now retired from, and I worked there for 45 years, when I, when I started the first day of my job, and I came in and I had all these degrees, and you know, and I started, I was an enge engineer, I won't say what company, but I came in and I started working. You know what the first thing was that they told me to do? They handed me a manual and said, read this. I said, well, I, 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 I'm a graduate of college, what do, you, what do I, I know, I know all I need to do, right? Wrong. You see, when you go to school, one of the things you learn that, that, you, uh, that you demonstrate is you have the ability to, to learn. Got to be careful as we get along in life and never lose that willingness to learn. Because really, learning is a lifelong process. And we always need to be open to learning new things. That doesn't mean you swallow everything that everybody you know, throws out uh, at you. But you should be wise enough to be able to discern what is good and what isn't. And if you're not sure, ask Google. No, don't ask Google. We know that they're a little... You've got to find a better engine, maybe Bing or something. I don't know. Uh, there are other ways. You, you have to do some research. If you're unsure, ask Rob. 
When will the Day of Atonement be? I said it's prophetic, and it points to an, uh, an event. What event does Yom Kippur point to? We look back at Hosea, the book of Hosea, Hosea, um, chapter 5, verse 15. And it's important to note that in this text that I'm going to look at with you in Hosea, God is speaking. Keep that in mind because some of these words that you will see here are, might be surprising when you realize who's talking. It's God himself who is speaking. And he says, I will go away and return to my place until they acknowledge their offense, singular, and seek my face. God is talking to Israel about them. I will go away and return to my place until they acknowledge their offense and seek my face. Now, wait a minute. How can God return to his place? I thought he's omnipotent, uh, omnipresent and everywhere. All it was. How can God return to his place unless he first left his place? God left his place? When did God ever leave his place? When did God ever leave his place? Oh. Only when he took on flesh at the incarnation. You remember that? He was God in the flesh. He was still God, but he took on flesh that he might be born and, and grow in this world and talk to men face to face. So God did, in a sense, leave his place, which was heaven, came to earth, and was incarnated. And what offense might cause him, might have caused him to return? What is Hosea writing here? One of the earliest prophets, by the way. One of the early prophets. What is he writing? Who, what offense could possibly cause God to return? And if you were there hearing Hosea talk about this when he first said it, what would you think? God, what do you mean leaving your place, God? What would you do? And what, what, we're never going to do anything that will drive you away from us. The rejection of his Messiahship certainly fits that, this prophetic text, doesn't it? How about this text from the Gospel of Luke? Chapter 13, verse 34. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those sent to her. How often I wanted to gather your children together just as a hen gathers her brood under her wings and you would not have it. You would not. These words were sent by the Lord himself when it became clear that the Jewish community of his day was going to reject him. And he knew that he was headed for the cross. That was a decision time, a decision point. But he goes on to say, Behold, your house is left to you desolate, and I say to you, you will not see me until the time comes when you say, Baruch haba b'shem Adonai. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. When will that happen? He goes on to say in, in Hosea, in their affliction, their physical affliction, the day will come when they will earnestly seek me. Boy, is God, he just has this all figured out. And he told it to everybody, and then everybody acts surprised when it happens. We should not be surprised. He put it in the text for us to read and learn and study and remember and under, understand. In their affliction, they will earnestly seek me. God left his place. In the midst of the great tribulation, the leadership of Israel, and some of you were here, I hope most of you were here, just uh, a week ago, Shab uh, last Shabbat, when I talked in Rosh Hashanah about this, the stages of the tribulation. In the midst of the great tribulation, the leadership of Israel will do a few things. 
They will realize their hopeless physical situation. They're surrounded by the enemy. They'll recognize that they were mistaken in rejecting Yeshua as their Messiah. And the leadership of Israel, the leaders of Israel, instead of turning away from Yeshua and turning the nation basically away from Yeshua, they are the ones who will lead the nation back to repent of turning away from Yeshua. And Israel will become, will turn to faith. They follow their leaders very well. Plead, and they will plead for him. The entire nation will plead for Yeshua to return and save them. And guess what? He does. Because that's what kind of God we have. But it'll take that moment during this tribulation. I, 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 I won't take the time now. You've heard me talk about it recently if you've been here. And if you weren't here, shame on you. No, you should have learned. But you can find these all on our wonderful website, thanks to our webmaster who was uh, um, quietly sitting in our congregation smiling. So without that, we wouldn't have these things. So thank you, Chris for all the work that you do behind the scenes. It's available to you. It's on our website. You can f go and look at these sermons that are out there with all the PowerPoints and everything. Moving on, when Isaiah says in chapter 6, verses 1 to 3, he says, these, and these are the words now. What you're seeing are the words that the leadership of Israel will use to convince the nation to turn back to Yeshua. Come, let us return to the Lord. He has torn us, but he will heal us. He has wounded us, but he will bandage us. He will revive us. After two days, he will raise us up on the third day that we may live before him. Remember, these are words that are prophetic for what will be said centuries, millennia, after they were, this was written. So, let us know, let us press on to know the Lord. His going forth is as certain as the dawn. You could take that to the bank. And he will come to us like the rain. He will fall like the spring rain watering the earth. What a beautiful image of God coming to man. He will heal us and bandage us. That's the day of atonement. That's Yom Kippur. And this is the appearance on earth at the end of that, the second coming. This is a text, and there are others that we could cite to talk about the coming of Yeshua. All from the Tanakh. Again, as we have uh, reviewed, we won't take the time to go through all of these in detail, but you remember, do you not, the eight uh, steps, the eight events in the last three and a half years of the tribulation? First one, assembling the allies of the Antichrist, destruction of Babylon, the fall of Jerusalem when the survivors flee to Basra, and the Antichrist attacks and surrounds the Israeli survivors at Basra. The nation of Israel comes to faith and pleads for Yeshua's return, they have no choice. They realize their back is against the wall. They finally, and the leadership comes to their senses and realizes why this is happening. They plead. The nation pleads for Yeshua's return, and we just read the words of the leadership that will be said in, the, in that day. And the trumpet of God sounds, that's mentioned uh, several times in the Brit Kaddishah as well as the Tanakh, and also mentioned, uh, yeah, that's the significance of, of Rosh Hashanah, the Yom Truah. It's that's a, the announcement of the second coming of Yeshua. And then, 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 Yeshua marches, comes down to save them and rescues them and marches from Basra up to uh, just east of the uh, temple where the temple is now. That's the area called the Valley of Jehoshaphat where he will judge Everyone. This is not the great white throne judgment, but this is, believer and non-believer alike will be judged. 
We're going to talk about that. Interestingly enough, next Shabbat, not this one, but the one after when we get back to 2 Corinthians. I don't know how we timed it so well, Rob. We're gonna, it's amazing to me because I, I almost cited, I, I told Bonnie, I said, you know, instead of doing this message on all the history, of, we could just go to 2 Corinthians and talk about it. And in fact, we will. A week from this Shabbat, come for Shabbat for Sukkot and uh, Simchat Torah. It'll be the week after that. I, I should say. We're going to talk about um, 2 Corinthians, how it connects with this, the, the, the judgment in the Valley of Jehoshaphat. That is the day of judgment. That is... When Yom Kippur, that's what it prophesies. Because if you are not already a believer, you'll wish you were. And finally, according to the text, according to the uh, interpretation of the text, and listen, good people can disagree about that, uh, these things. I always say, people are entitled to their mistaken opinion. Everybody, no, you know, it, it's okay it's, it, to have different views on, on these things. Prophecy is, uh, is a time for, uh, uh, you have to be generous. You have to be willing to consider other people's positions. But this is one very good interpretation, putting the text together uh, of what Scripture is telling us. So now, how do you get ready? Is everybody here ready? Everybody here is cleansed and perfect? Everybody's got their, their act together? You're all ready. Listen, if Yeshua comes, you know, in the next five minutes or sooner, you'll be ready, right? How can anyone be completely ready for that day of judgment? Because he's going to review everything that you've done. Because he has a pretty good record. I always, I laugh at that because I think about, you start thinking about the things that you've done that you would be a little embarrassed about. Just this morning. When somebody was parked in your spot or when that car didn't turn and get out of the way so you could get where you needed. I mean, I, I mean, we've, we all struggle. Many ways, many ways. <laughs> it doesn't take long. But, how can anyone be completely ready for that day of judgment? Ah, oh. only through the grace of God. Because we can't clean ourselves up, in case you have noticed. It's like the muddy boy who's taking one hand and wiping himself off, and then taking this muddy hand and going like that, trying to get the mud off him. All he's doing is spreading it around. We could try, not going to work. Only the grace of God. He's the only one that can clean us up. There's a text in Psalm 37. It says, the steps of a good man. That's you, right? The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. You know what God wants. You Try to walk in his ways. The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. But he's not perfect. God knows that. And though he fall, God won't utterly cast him down. It's like the boy who falls. The father is there to catch him. We're going to close today just want to uh, share this thought with you. At, uh, as the close of this Yom Kippur service, we're praying now. We implore you, eternal God, let the year upon which we have entered be a year of blessing and prosperity, a year of salvation and comfort for our loved ones and for all Israel, a year of peace and contentment a year of joy and of love, a year of virtue and reverence for you, a year that finds our hearts united, a year of growth in the grace and knowledge of Messiah Yeshua. 
Now to him who was able to keep you from stumbling and to make you stand in the presence of his glory, blameless with great joy to the only God, our Savior, through Messiah Yeshua, our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever. And all God's people then. Amen. Amen. And Gamar Khatima Tova be Yeshua. May you be completed and sealed for a good year, a good in Yeshua. Gamar Khatima Tova be Yeshua. And uh, Shabbat Shalom. It is a Shabbat even today to all of you. May God bless you in Yeshua's name. Amen.